Hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I'd like to give you a brief lecture on the gross pathology of the musculoskeletal system of the pig. As I do at the beginning of all my lectures, I need to thank my colleagues who have provided their images that make these lectures possible either directly or through uploading them to a number of online collections, including Piggy or Noah's Archive. Let's start with cyclopia, also known as synophthalmus, a condition which is generally seen in ruminants as a result of consumption of veratrum californicum or false hellbore. However, this constellation of craniofacial and neurological abnormalities can also result spontaneously in pigs, dogs, cats, and humans as a result of anything that interrupts the sonic hedgehog signaling pathway in its effect on PAX-6. This very important pathway early in development will result in the division into mirrored halves of the brain and associated structures, including the eye, as well as the subsequent formation of the skeleton around them. Affected animals have a single lobe to their brain called holoprosencephaly. They lack the part of the brain which controls uh, smell, and their noses are placed in odd places like on top of their forehead or maybe arising from their hard palate. The change in the brain is called arinencephaly. There are actually two eyes in a single orbit, there's a single cornea, and behind that, all of the paired structures, including a paired optic nerve. And the proper term is synophthalmus. For a better description of this and some great pictures, take a look at my recent lecture on developmental anatomies of the eye. Here's a pig where the two parts of the cranium did not fuse before birth and there is a large outpouching of the skin. If you incise this, you may find a lot of fluid and the meninges, which would result in it being called a meningocele. There may actually be brain tissue within it. So this would be a meningoencephalocele. If these are present further on down the axial skeleton as a result of improper formation of the vertebral bodies, you may see a meningomyelocele. These are probably under genetic influence, but they're polygenetic, and a lot of things go into their formation. Usually when the offending boar or sow is removed the, from the herd, the number of these decrease markedly. What do you call a pig with no legs? A groundhog. No, actually, the proper term would be amelia, or legless. Here's a condition affecting the legs that we know a lot more about. This is arthrogryposis, and unlike ruminants and other production animals in which the majority of these cases are the result of in utero viral formation, or viral infection and malformation of the central nervous system. In pigs, they're usually the result of either deficiencies or something that is contaminating the feed of the sow. There is a congenital complex which affects Yorkshire pigs in an autosomal recessive manner, which is known as arthrogryposis multiplex congenita. And it has been associated with a genetic defect on chromosome 5 of the AMC gene and results in significant arthrogryposis of all four legs and ankylosis of the affected joints. The other abnormality that we can see here that has been uh, associated with abnormalities of this gene complex is brachynathia inferior 
or an undershot jaw. Other common abnormalities, such as cleft lips or palates or hydrocephalus, have not been seen in this particular syndrome. Here's another arthrogropotic pig, and a number of substances have been able to be fed to sows during pregnancy that result in this particular complex, including tobacco or tobacco stalks, Conia maculatum, also known as poison hemlock. And just from a management point of view, if you're feeding your animals anything that starts out with poison, it's probably not a good feed additive. Jimson weed, black cherry, and in utero deficiencies of manganese and vitamin A have all been associated with this abnormality in pigs. Notice how thick the foreleg is in this piglet. This is a condition known as congenital hyperostosis or diaphyseal dysplasia, which is similar to a condition known as Caffey's disease in humans. And it's a rare autosomal disease seen in newborn land race and Duroc pigs, primarily affecting the forelimbs as seen here. The radius and ulnar and the region around them is markedly thick and it might be twice, almost three times its normal diameter with a redness of the overlying skin, which has been removed here to show you exactly how thick this leg gets. Here is a cut section, and what I want you to notice is that there is a large area of white primarily overlying the diaphyseal reason. Here's another picture with a little more color, a little less proliferation. And all of this white material overlying the radius and the ulna is periosteal new bone growth. And the periosteum is actually all the way up here, very close to the dermis. The overlying muscles are somewhat atrophic. And the periosteum itself is so thick in that the fibrous connective tissue incorporates the soft tissues of the muscle and the dermis which makes it very difficult, if not impossible, for this animal to move its front legs. These animals do not survive, they cannot ambulate, and they often die of cardiac dysrhythmia. The cause of this tremendous proliferation of periosteal new bone is not known. It only affects the outside of the bone between the lamellar bone of the cortex and the periosteum. There are no changes on the endosteal surface of the bone, so this could not be confused with something like osteopetrosis. There have been a number of theories about how this arises, but there is nothing proven as of yet. Something that you might consider to be a congenital defect is a highly prized asset in a certain breed of collector pig known as the mule foot, and this is syndactyly. These animals only have three claws instead of four. The two middle claws are fused, and this is seen in a specialized type of hog known as the mule foot hog. Back around the turn of the 20th century, mule foot hogs were thought to be uh, very resistant to the common diseases of the day, including hog cholera and various respiratory diseases, and they're very much in, uh, in demand. As vaccination got cheaper and, and actually more effective, uh, their popularity waned significantly. In the late 60s, there were very few left, and due to one breeder in Louisiana um, who continues to breed these hogs, you can now buy them for your small farms, and they're unique in the fact that uh, they have only three instead of four claws. Otherwise, they're fairly nondescript looking hogs. Here's another congenital abnormality um, associated with the development of the musculoskeletal system in this picture from uh, Helen Ackland, who worked back in the 1980s with 
identifying the teratogenic effects of albendazole, which is still a common uh, vermifuge in coccidia stat today. But you can see that these pigs had a number of musculoskeletal defects, the easiest being the formation of additional toes. Confinement reared pigs don't get a lot of ultraviolet light. So the incidence of rickets can be fairly high in some operations. And here we can see the uh, uh, enlargement of the costochondral junction growth plates, uh, which is one of the places that you will see abnormalities associated with rickets. As well, you will see them in the legs in pigs. Pigs don't get scurvy. Pigs are one of the species that can make vitamin C, so that's one that they don't have to be supplemented. I think these would make excellent key rings. If you do enough pigs, you'll find that they will have ectopic ossification of the mesentery, primarily in the region of the mesenteric root, and it doesn't cause any problems. If you feel up there, you might find a small piece of bone, and then you can collect it and boil it down and have a nice collection like this one. I showed you a picture of this when we talked about the hematolymphatic system, but this is an absolutely gorgeous picture of the effects of congenital porphyria in pigs. The genetics of it have not been worked out as well as it has in other species. They do have elevated levels of uroporphyrinogen in their urine and a defect likely in uroporphyrinogen 3 cosynthetase. In contrast to cattle, they do not present with signs of photosensitization. And in contrast to the cat, they do not exhibit any hemolytic anemia. So how this particular variant of congenital porphyria fits in the overall scheme is yet to be worked out. But pigs do get it too. Histologically, there is no change in the affected bones. They're simply pigmented grossly. And if you look at them under the microscope, they're the normal color. It's simply a gross pigmentation of the bone as the excessive levels of porphyrin in the blood works its way. Abscesses, specifically vertebral abscesses, are not uncommon in older, uh, both sows and boars. As you can imagine, this can be fairly devastating for your breeding operation because an affected boar is not going to want to mount. Um, many of these abscesses are present throughout the entire life of the pig and may actually start in the piglet as a coliform infection of the navel. And they can be latent for a number of years. Eventually what you're going to culture out of these is Truparella pyogenes, which is a great opportunist and loves these micro aerophilic environments. This was a great case from Virginia Pierce of the Maryland Regional Veterinary uh, Diagnostic Lab, and you can see a large vertebral abscess from which she, of course, cultured Truparella pyogenes, affecting the vertebra at the insertion of one of the ribs. And this was an older pig from a rescue, and these pigs have wonderful lesions, just about every organ system, and you can almost do an entire residency if you get one of these 12 to 15-year-old pigs and this animal had abscesses throughout the body, including a large abscess, which might have served as the initial portal of entry uh, in the foot just above the claw. And this is very common in, uh, in these pet pigs, especially those who are kept primarily outside. They have a lot of foot problems, and it might be the cause of uh, all of the others. But this animal had multiple pulmonary and uh, pleural abscesses, vegetative valvular endocarditis, all of which Truparella pyogenes was recovered. So it's a common isolate in pigs, not always what caused the initial problem, but what you're going to get months, if not years, down the road. It's a little different when we talk about the intervertebral discs. Um, when we talk about the disc itself, the bacteria that are usually isolated might be Erysiplethrix or Brucella suis. 
The vertebra and discs tend to get a lot of bacterial infections over time, probably because of the way the blood vessels are in the vertebra. They tend to make sharp hairpin turns, especially near the end plates. And the same thing goes on in the discs. Uh, note that there, this animal was put down because of neurologic abnormalities, because this disc eventually blew out dorsally into the spinal cord, compressing it and causing probably posterior paresis, uh, significant ataxia. But I also want you to see the prominent spondylosis underneath, which means that this disc blew out first below. This is a much more long-standing lesion than what we have here. Um, and we see vertebral spondylosis in a wide range of species, uh, especially our older military working dogs, because discs as a habit tend to blow out more commonly ventrally, where they don't cause much problem, and the body will try to stabilize that unstable joint by putting down fibrous connective tissue and bone. So when you see, either radiographically or at autopsy, ventral spondylosis, the disc above generally is abnormal, and you will have seen a breakdown and probably an extrusion of the fibrotic nucleus pulposus in a ventral manner. This is an unfortunate pig with a large area of cellulitis, hemorrhage, and crepitus in the area of the jowls, and these pigs usually just lay there for 12 to 24 hours and moan and groan, and then they die. This is what we see with malignant edema caused by Clostridium septicum. Pigs are not susceptible to black leg, but it acts very similar. This is not so much muscle-based. It will affect the muscles, but it is a cellulitis um, that can also be caused by uh, uh, some of the other Clostridia, including Clostridium sordelli uh, and even Clostridium perfringens. Most commonly in pigs, it affects right here the ventral cervical area and the shoulder. Initially, they don't want to bear any weight, and then this area becomes blotchy, and then they are in lateral recumbence, recumbency. And unfortunately, this is why they, uh, they lay there and just moan and groan. Tremendous devastation and crepitus uh, and exudation within this tissue. You may see a fibrinohemorrhagic peritonitis and pulmonary edema with this as well. Causes probably a wound. I suspect that a number of these cases are due to injections because people don't want to inject the ham uh, you want to inject the least uh, economically affected part of the pig, and that's often in and around the neck. And if you're doing this a lot and you're not careful with your, uh, with your hygiene, you may inject one of these very common bacteria or set up a situation where the bacteria may flourish. Like other... Uh, clostridial diseases, what we are generally looking at, uh, and it's most easy to demonstrate in the muscle, is you will see a fibrinohemorrhagic or a necrohemorrhagic cellulitis and underlying mitositis with emphysema. These large bubbles are the formation of gas, and this gives this lesion a crepitant feeling. A couple of other rule outs that you need to strongly consider in diseases which affect the jowl area of the pig. Uh, this is the most important one. This is anthrax. Anthrax is usually ingested by the pig and will set up a large area of necrosis and edema within the pharynx um, and the ventral neck. You may see bloodstained froth in the mouth or around the noses, and petechia on the skin. Uh, the pulmonary form is really rarely seen, and usually in uh, baby pigs, resulting in a, a death within less than 24 hours by severe lobular pneumonia. Now, most of the time that you'll encounter anthrax, the practitioners, veterinarians in the area will know that there is occasional anthrax um, outbreaks 
after periodic uh, uh, periods alternating between dry and wet and dry and wet. The problem with anthrax is you do not want to necropsy these animals. If left alone, the normal putrefactive bacteria, which you see, uh, which during decomposition of the cadaver, will overwhelm the anthrax bacilli, which at this point are in all tissues. It's a bacteremia, so it circulates, and whether you take a piece of liver or spleen or lymph node, you're going to uh, expose a lot of those uh, bacilli to oxygen, whereupon they will form spores, which are very long-lasting in the soil. Best way to do this is to contact your your uh, uh, re local regulatory vet um, and arrange for testing of a blood sample. A couple of drops of blood on a card can be tested by PCR for the identification of the agent, and the last thing that you want to do is do any field necropsies on these because you will contaminate that site for years to come. The third uh, thought I would have here, um, and thank you Joe Anderson, one of my residents, for reminding me about this uh, yesterday, would be uh, jowl abscesses. These are caused by Streptococcus porcinus in, uh, in pigs, and it's very much like strangles in the horse. Um, this particular agent has a tropism for the uh, lymph nodes of the neck, including the mandibular lymph nodes and the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, and you can have swelling in this area. They may abscess out just like a horse with strangles. So those would be the three things I would think about um, in pigs with swollen necks, of course, malignant edema, anthrax, and streptococcus porcinus. case of tetanus in a pig, in animals that are not kept in uh, clean environments, uh, they can get uh, uh, injection of Clostridium tetani by uh, a puncture wound. And Clostridium tetani produces a toxin called tetanospasm, which affects the Renshaw cells of the spinal cord. And Renshaw cells are inhibitory neurons, which prevent your lower motor neurons from firing all the time. They normally are firing all the time. These Renshaw neurons stop that and allow them to relax. Well, when the tetanospasm affects the Renshaw neurons and occupies their uh, postsynaptic terminals, they cannot release their inhibitors, and you get extension of most of the major muscles. Bipeds are somewhat unique in that our biceps muscles in our arms are stronger than our triceps. So if you're dealing with a human or a primate, generally the front legs will be drawn up in, in what's known as a pugilistic position. But in most of our domestic species, uh, the extensors are always stronger than the, uh, uh, the flexors. So all four legs are out. You can also see that this animal's ear is back and its eyes are somewhat uh, uh, drawn back because all the facial, facial muscles are in spasm as well. These animals will die quickly of uh, uh, inability to breathe. A well-known muscle condition of pigs is known as a number of names. Porcine stress syndrome, malignant hyperthermia, and the white muscle, which is found primarily in the muscles of the hind limbs, especially quadriceps, some of the back muscles, is known as PSE pork, or pale, soft, and exudative. Three words that really put off the consumer in the supermarket. The muscle is pale and soft because it's necrotic. And it's exudative because this necrotic tissue will leak tissue fluids and serum. And if you cut into it, it just sort of exudes a, uh, a very unpalatable, unappealing fluid. This is a genetic problem caused by a defect in the ryanodine receptor of affected pigs, which is responsible for allowing the removal of calcium from muscle fibers. The condition is often stimulated by 
any type of stress or excitement, and most often stimulated by transport in affected animals. But it can also be triggered by a number of anesthetics, including halothane and some forms of muscle relaxants. When too much calcium is released into muscle fibers, it causes two basic problems. One, calcium is what causes contraction of the muscle fibers as the myofilament proteins, actin and mycin, migrate across each other in the presence of calcium and contract. When the defective cells cannot remove the calcium from the cytoplasm, these muscle fibers stay in a hypercontracted state resulting in an overall elevated temperature, which is the hyperthermia part of this syndrome, as well as eventual degeneration and necrosis and release of potassium into the bloodstream. And these animals generally die of hyperkalemia. The other thing that calcium does in the cell is it poisons the mitochondria. So kills the mitochondria, the animal does not have enough uh, mitochondria left to create ATP, goes into anaerobic glycolysis, acidosis, etc. So calcium is a very potent toxin, although it's a normal component of myofibers, in excess it's a very potent toxin. And these animals with their defective varionidine receptors cannot remove it from the cell and store it in the psycho sarcoplasmic reticulum where calcium is normally stored in between requirements for muscle contraction. And here's just another great picture by Dr. Kim Newkirk at the University of Tennessee showing the contrast between the affected degenerate or necrotic muscle and the intact counterpart. A classic disease of pigs is measly pork. These are the cystocerci of Tinea solium. The host of this parasite is human. It is a human tapeworm, and pigs will get into contaminated feed, and the uh, larval cestode will migrate out of the intestine and usually heads for skeletal or cardiac muscle, seems to hone in on high metabolic targets like that, but occasionally they will pop up in odd places like the brain. So, um, and people can be contaminated again by eating undercooked pork, although by far a much more common way that people contract tinea solium is by uh, getting it from somebody who hasn't washed their hands, who is infected, or uh, the pretty much outlawed use of night soil or human waste as fertilizer. This tinea solium, we share this one primarily with pigs. Another cestode parasite of pigs will be found in the muscle of pigs, and this is a condition known as sparganosis. It is a pleurocircoid uh, larvae of a stage of pseudophilidian tapeworms. And it goes through a somewhat complex life cycle, but one of the mandatory components is a copepod in water. And fish or frogs may pick this up as a, uh, uh, a peritonic host. And if they are eaten by a pig or another mammal or a person, they may pass on the uh, these particular parasites, or you can get it, get them from eating undercooked pork. So you could directly eat the parasite that way and become infected. There have been a number of cases where people have used frogs and poultices and put these poultices on open wounds, especially around the eyes, and passed on the parasite that way. So this is sparganosis. Let's finish up with some joint problems in pigs. And joint problems start as early as birth from the contamination of an umbilical cord from fecal material and coliforms get into the bloodstream and may settle out into the joints. Joint problems are fairly common in pigs and we've said before that a, a infection like this might be a very long-standing or even lifelong infection in swine. What you will see in these pigs 
is a little bit fibrant and fluid within the joints, but you will see a lot of other lesions associated with systemic sepsis. As these pigs get a little bit older and grow into the grower phase, we've talked in a number of lectures about uh, fibrinous polycerositis and the agents that cause that may also infiltrate the joints, which are a potential space, just like the thoracic cavity or the abdominal cavity or the meninges, and you may get fibrinous arthritis or, po of, or tenosynovitis of the joints. Remember, at necropsy, we always want to open, especially in young animals, open seven joints. Pick whatever joints you want, the knees or the carpi or uh, the hock, but always hit seven joints. And if you get seven clear joints, it only takes a minute, then you can say that the animal did not have infectious arthritis. The agents that we see in this form of arthritis during the growing phase are the same ones that cause fibrinous polycerositis. So that would be Strepsuus, Mycoplasma, Hyorhinus, and Ammophilus parasus, all capable of causing uh, this type of fibrinous acute arthritis. Probably could also throw Mycoplasma hyosynovii in there as a fourth. Older pigs well past the, uh, the market age, especially the breeding stock, may develop a chronic arthritic condition which is characterized by proliferation of the synovia into these sort of villous appendages or villonodular synovitis. And this is what is seen with chronic erysipelothrix rusiopathy infection, where we, how we see it in all of the other uh, all of its other manifestations is a little different, which causes more acute disease and thrombosis. The two chronic manifestations of erysipelothrix infection are this bilis synovitis. These animals are lame and they can't do much breeding, so they're not economically very viable. And the other thing that you would look for in this animal would be vegetative valvular endocarditis. Osteochondrosis is a big problem in pigs. It has a very complex pathogenesis in all the species in which we see, but I'll boil it down, hopefully, to a couple of sentences. We see osteochondrosis when we raise animals too big, too fast. And of course, that's the name of the game with producing pork. You want to get the best weight gain that you can. But joints were developed to maintain and bear weight one way. And when we put all of this muscle and fat and everything on of these animals, we alter the way that the weight is put on these developing joints, because this is what we see usually in young animals. And what essentially happens is the alteration of the forces cause areas in which the vasculature, which supply the articular cartilage and the growth plate in pigs is compressed. And these animals undergo periods of ischemia at these abnormal points, and it causes degenerative changes in the overlying articular cartilage as seen here in a number of areas in pigs, including the medial femoral condyle, the condyles of the humerus, the glenoid tubercle of the scapula, the lumbar vertebra, and the distal ulna. And then you can get these degenerative lesions, which ultimately can go all the way to osteochondritis dissecans, where large flaps of the articular cartilage come off. The animals will be chronically arthritic. You may have ankylosis of the joints at this point, and it becomes a mess. Okay, same thing can happen in the physis, in the area of the distal ulna and femur, uh, and the head of the femur, and the ischial tuberosity, which we'll look at in just a minute. The elbow joints are another common place, and it's just from putting too much weight on these animals too quickly. We see this in horses, which are, are pushed along too fast, in large breed dogs, and it just alters the way that weight goes on the joint, and you get underlying, underlying the articular cartilage, or even within the articular cartilage, the blood vessels, which disappear when, the, with, when that growth plate closes. They just pinch down to nothing and you get these ischemic lesions, and this is the long-term effect of that. 
remember that in pigs, it can even affect the growth plate. And you get ischemia of the growth plate. And one of the well-known areas where this happens is the tuber ischii. And we see this change in sows between the ages of 8 months and 18 months. And you'd say, well, you know, by 8 months, all the growth plates should be closed. Well, in pigs, they sort of have a delayed closure of some of their growth plates. Not all of them, but some of them. And especially here, the tuber ischium, you can still find cartilage up to three years of age. So what happens is you get ischemia and eventually just the stress of these big animals getting up and down and the tendons which insert on the, at the top of the, the ischium, it just pops them back off and they go down and they can't come back up because that's that area is connected to all of the large tendons affecting the muscles of the hind limb, especially in what we eventually turn into ham. So a similar thing is seen in cats, uh, sort of heavy neutered male cats, young cats will pop off the top of their femurs. Same sort of thing and the condition is known as epiphysiolysis. Here's a little pig, and he's scooting around on his behind, and he usually sits with his legs out. And this is a condition known as splay leg, which is seen more in land race uh, pigs than, than other breeds. And if you were to section his muscle right now, and I hope you don't, because if you give him about two weeks, he's going to come back to normal, because this is a self-limiting disease. But if you decided you didn't want to have him around, and you wanted to see what was going on, you would find that the myofibrils in his back legs and the affected muscles are very small, maybe only as large in cross-section as the surrounding satellite nuclei. They're absolutely tiny. And the reason behind this, nobody knows the cause, but the reason behind this is around the time of birth, the type 2 fibers in these muscles, and it might be not just the hind limbs, it might be the forelimbs. Sometimes you see with all four legs splayed out and they can't move at all. But uh, these type 2 fibers will within usually trans transfer to type 1 fibers, type 2 being the, the fast twitch, type 1 being the slow twitch, which are, are the stronger muscle fibers. And this is a normal process in the pig. But within the in these uh, splay leg pigs, this is delayed, and it can be delayed for one to two weeks. That's eventually going to happen, but it's delayed, so they do not have the strength or the muscle fiber size to actually get up and walk around. It's been associated with a number of etiologies. There's probably a genetic predisposition since it's seen primarily in land race, but people have put forth a lot of nutritional causes and mycotoxin, and uh, it's even been reproduced by injecting sows within the last week before birth with dexamethasone, which sort of slows everything down. And it's a normal development. It's just delayed in these particular pigs. Let's finish up this section with some very common, uh, usually incidental findings in pigs. Um, and these are hernias. Here's an umbilical hernia, which they'll occur in both sexes, and they usually develop um, as a result of poor umbilical cord management, maybe infection of the navel, um, or navel sucking by uh, penmates. It's not an inherited condition, but these kind of defects will markedly decrease what you can get for your pigs at market. This is a inguinal hernia, maybe the result of poor castration or simply an open inguinal canal and the intestines will get down inside the scrotum. You can actually pick these pigs up and sort of shake them and, uh, and they will migrate down in the scrotum. Once again, they usually don't strangulate. They're often not a problem. However, these kind of defects when you pick your, take your pigs to market and you're trying to get top dollar um, will decrease the amount of what people will give to you. It's just sort of a weakness here of the tunica vaginalis, not a, any life-threatening, but, you know, uh, business is business. Okay, well, that covers the musculoskeletal system, and this is actually the last lecture 
um, that I will be providing for diseases of pigs. The end of the training year at the Joint Pathology Center is upon us, so I probably will decrease the frequency of putting these lectures together. We will start again in the fall and over the summertime as time allots. Um, I will be putting up some additional lectures on some other species, and I thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed these lectures, and I look forward to, uh, um, to discussing them with any of the, you that would like to contact me, either through Facebook or through the YouTube channel, and uh, I hope everyone has a great day.